Becca. My name is Sarah Timmerman, and I'm just going to be reading a few pieces, uh, sections from my piece, Conversations with My Past. They want me to find love. They try to fix me up. I have a great personality, they tell me. I'm smart, they assert. By the way, had I thought about going back to the gym? I tell them I am doing yoga, and I don't mention the repressed bundle of my soul that believes that the size 2 version of myself could ruin a relationship just as fast as the size 12. In downward facing dog, I glance up at the never changing mound of my stomach, and moving into cobra, press it hard into my green mat, as if I can force it to disappear. Taking with it the fear embedded within the soft flesh, the intense panic that foams in the pit of my belly when a man looks at me as if he's imagining me entwined around his life instead of his body. Instead, I confess a fear that men will never love me, that they just want me to love them. And I'll never tell them how reassuring this thought actually is, how I draped it, that thought around myself as he moved his warm hands against my shoulders, his fingers pressed into my skin as if he was sculpting me, as he softly told me about the project he was working on. Instead, in deep discussions over shallow advice, I tell them about my other crushes, ask about their most recent date, and agree that it isn't their fault they are alone. They were just too different. He needed someone who could serve him dinner on time and have sex on a semi-annual basis. She needed her father to keep his hands to himself, and my father to recognize her depression 15 years earlier. They are sure that it is better to have loved and lost. I try not to drop the phone as I maneuver into my trench coat trying to hold my notebook and coffee in the other hand and laugh at that ridiculous statement. They try to prove they are right. They're happy with the way things turned out. They learned, they have six beautiful children, and they did their best. They are happy. I smile, move out the front door, and let them have this one. I'm happy they are happy. I talk around the money I lent them, the upcoming court dates, the job hunts, the therapy sessions, and their latest breakup. I'm just happy they are happy. They are depressed. They feel like failures. They are bothered that they couldn't make their marriage work. At 11 o'clock at night, the events of the last month are ready for an emotional reheating. I tell them to go to sleep. They tell me they failed at raising their kids, and I try not to take this personally. <laughs> Remind them how hard they try. I hold the phone in place with my shoulder and clean the dishes from his visit last night that were left undone because my hands were exploring more interesting surfaces. I remind them how much I love them. I remind them that I will always love them, that I will always be there for them. They joke about committing suicide. Everyone would be happier. I sigh and rub the rag around the inside of another mug. Repeat everything again. They ask what I did last night, and I tell them I made him dinner. They try not to seem too interested, but a few sentences later they reminisce about my little sister's wedding. Didn't I notice how in love they were? Wasn't it beautiful how her now husband cried when he saw her coming down the aisle? Don't I want that eventually? Hasn't she chosen a better life? I wipe my hands on a red dish rag, tell them that my own wedding is a long way off and we spent the rest of the evening planning our funerals. <laughs> they call to ask if I've considered trying online dating. I ignore the newest email invitation to join Match.com that they forward me. They invite me to Hallmark movie nights or send me articles defending male chivalry and the importance of letting your date get the tab. I remind them how shitty they treated each other. They accuse me of only remembering the bad. I think silently of frivolous restraining orders, Christmas mornings ending in the kitchen table heaped across the room, and the look of contempt that became standard whenever one of them was speaking. Things I can't mention or forget. The defensive note in their voices rises, even without these recollections, and I try not to tell them that those things don't happen when you love someone, that the bad sometimes makes the good irrelevant. Later, I sit on the kitchen counter across from him and try not to fall. It's four in the morning and his hands are holding my favorite volume of poetry. The images he's reading blends into my other senses. I can almost taste the words along with the dark chocolate and wine residue. I casually wonder what his mouth would taste like. And as I twirl my fingers around his knee, I play with the idea of trying. His voice drops and moves around the lines on the page. The thought of doing just this for another 20 years whips around my brain, and I start to entwine his life with mine for a few minutes before I pull back my hand. I've never been in love. Not the sticky, sweet, weak, mean, meat, cute, irresistible fantasy love that I grew up hoping was the reality. 
Not the everyday version, where loving someone consists of tearing apart their heart, trying to stuff these pieces into the holes of your own. I happen to choose a different life. So be lonely. Isolation is a gift. Thank you.